Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. A warm welcome to all the participants from across the globe at the Horasis Asia Meeting 2021. I'm Preeti Dubey, founding director of Strive High, a soft skills consultancy and development company based in Singapore. In capacity of a management psychologist, a leadership and performance coach, I have coached and trained thousands of managers and leaders globally, especially women. I am honored to share the discussion on gender inequality, a topic that needs urgent attention as it concerns half of the world's population. It is negatively impacting the entire population, casting damaging economic consequences for regions where significant gender gaps in education and employment exist and affecting the efficiency and growth of organizations with less representation of women in leadership positions. All of this has severe repercussions on the sustainable development of the entire world. I have a panel comprising of highly accomplished, experienced and eminent speakers. Constance Agumen, Director, International Development, Nesta Challenges from United Kingdom. Ayumi Moore, Moore Aoki, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Women in Tech, joining us from France. Amelia Lopez Huix, General Partner, MCI Partners, from joining us from Netherlands. Head Wish Nuance. Managing Director, International Banking Federation, joining us from United Kingdom. Deborah Wong, Chief Executive Officer, Kingdom Investment and Development, joining us from USA. We had, they have been working diligently in their respective capacity to make a difference and walk the talk themselves. There is no denying the fact that gender diversity has progressed over the last decades. More girls are going to school, fewer girls are forced into early marriage, more women are serving in parliament and leadership positions. Laws are being reformed and advance, uh, to advance the gender equality. But the gender gaps in economic participation have barely changed in the last 20 years. Only 50% of the women in the working age population are economically active compared to 84% of the men. 78% of women workers in South and Southwest Asia and 60% in Southeast Asia are concentrated in vulnerable employment. Now, as we know, women's progress has been shadowed by discriminatory laws and pervasive social, pervasive social norms. Women and girls are discriminated against in health, education, political representation, labor market. They continuously face challenges surrounding childcare, personal safety, access to good sanitization, etc. Now, therefore, throughout the world, women receive less education and are not employed at the same rate as their male counterparts. And they continue to be underrepresented in all levels of political leadership. COVID-19 has further exasperated the situation. It has left many women struggling to keep their jobs as the boundaries between work and home have blurred and their unpaid care work increased significantly due to school closures and increased needs of the older people. So the pandemic has also led to steep increase in violence against women and girls. Not to forget that nearly 60% of the women in the informal economy, um, it, it, it puts them uh, at great, greater risk of falling into poverty. So the situation is indeed grave and needs serious attention at both policy level and implementation level. Hence, the United Nations move to adopt gender equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2015 is indeed reassuring. The member states have committed to making gender equality an essential goal as they recognize gender equality as a catalyst for progress of achieving sustainability, equality, peace and human progress for all countries and people. However, we know that many cultures consider women as unequal to men. And despite their government's acceptance of the UN goal, goals, most Asian demographics are failing to achieve them. 
The question is, how can they accomplish this a daunting task? Should they suffer sanctions for missing some UN goals? How may their attitudes be changed? Now, these questions will be the focus of our discussion today. And we have an array of astute panelists who will share their views on the topic. I would like to request them to speak about the journey and make their opening comments. I would first like to invite Amelia Lopez with her introduction, please. Hello, my name is Amelia. I'm originally from Spain, but I live in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So my journey into gender equality started, I was originally at the very young age, I was an Olympian swimmer. And uh, the very young age, I became an IT engineer. I was the global IT managing director of Honeywell. But then motherhood uh, kicked in my life and that I experienced gender equality 20 years ago. Uh, it was by experiencing one of the most pervasive gender inequality issues that is that of bringing children to the world and it's known by the motherhood penalty. And in that sense, so uh, my journey to gender equality started by having a strong commitment that telling myself that being the mother of my children was not going to be the last thing I was going to do in that planet, but the first of many. So I became in 2010 and a strong advocate for maternity protection, entering the Commission on the Status of Women together with Melinda Gates and another group of advocates with Women Delivered to present the first framework on gender equality on that commission uh, in, the, in the United Nations. And since then, I have been working as an advisor, especially in gender and macroeconomics, uh, advising heads of state and especially ministers of economy around the world on the importance of gender. without gender equality. It's not that women will not progress, no country in the planet will progress. And for sure, the sustainable development agenda that will give prosperity in the ideal vision for the planet will not be achieved. We can go in much more detail at my basic job. Uh, currently, I'm, uh, I'm leading the UN Global Compact Target Gender Equality Program for Dutch multinationals in order to accelerate the progress uh, of the participation of women, especially in the economy, but overall in all society that is fundamental. Wow, what a phenomenal accomplishment and I, we are really privileged to have you with us today. Um, I would now like to invite Hedwish Nguyen's, please share with us about your journey. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. So my name is Edwige Nguyen's. Uh, I'm the leading the International Banking Federation. So I have had a much uh, economic and financial career. Uh, now I'm representing the bank industry worldwide. So that means that in my career, I had the chance to build all the skills, the experience and the network that is important actually to make change happen. And along this way, I have been helping and advocating for gender diversity for more than 20 years. So as I lacked a role model myself when I was a young girl and starting in the job, I really took the plea whenever I will have the chance to be in a position of influence, I will help other women. And that I've been doing consistently. I've been chairing the Women's Network at Bemi Paribas. Now I'm chairing European Women on Boards. And it's really about sharing that knowledge, engaging with women, but also engaging with each stakeholder that can make change happen. And very uh, happy to share later on. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And I really like that you are there to, you know, uh, not missing any step to make the change happen. And we'll learn from you later. Uh, I would uh, now in, like to invite Constance Agumen. Please share about your journey, Constance. Thank you so much. Um, my journey really is a, a programmatic one in gender equality. Um, I've been running challenge prizes for the past decade, incentive prizes, and really trying to encourage innovators to take part in programs. Uh, and what we recognize in that space is that most of the inventors that are engaging in our work and even in programs are, uh, in terms of developing grants or getting grants have been men. And so there is a real need to ensure that the program design and development um, that we're undertaking is really encouraging women to take part, is encouraging women at all levels of the program development. So with my um, programmatic lens, I'm trying to ensure that whatever roles that are undertaken from the design and research and scoping, engaging women, ensuring women have positions of uh, 
you know, as researchers, as a part of the conversation, all the way through to judging panels, decision makers, and are not just seen as beneficiaries of, of programs and are not just seen as the ones at the end of the spectrum. If you don't have that voice from the beginning, you don't um, have good ways to encourage women um, uh, into participation. And therefore, you know, I'm very much about how do we ensure programs are, are representative of women across the whole spectrum. Um, and that's my journey <laughs> that I'm continuing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And that's an amazing journey and uh, very enriching and, and uh, for the women that, you know, you have been supporting and I'm going to, uh, you know, get your um, views later again. Uh, before that, I would like to um, request Ayumi Mure Aoke to share about her journey, please. Uh, you're on mute, Ay uh, Ayumi. I know, sorry. The babies were like, they were making so much noise. I thought <laughs> I might as well put the mic off. I'm sorry. So I was saying it started quite early in life. So I was from Brazil when I, and I went to, I moved to South Africa when I was 12. And at the time, it was apartheid years. So there was a lot of discrimination, but not only, gen not only no racial oh. discrimination, but there was a lot of gender discrimination as well, which I learned at school. I had to go. There was something called home economics. Perhaps the ladies from the UK, you know. But at that time, I had to learn how to cook, how to sew, and how to clean um, with a broom. While the boys, they would do you know, woodwork and metalwork and such exciting things. And for the same sports, in sports, we couldn't do the same sports as boys, you know. We, I, wanted, I went to see a girls rowing, oh, sorry, not a girls rowing team. I went to see a, a friend of mine go row, <laughs> her brother. And I thought it was so beautiful, you know, seeing like those boats, you know, on the river. It reminded me like of the film, you know, Dead Boat Society and things. And I wanted to go into the boat, but I wasn't allowed to. And I asked, but how, how come we can't go? And she says, because we are girls. Girls, they were not allowed to go on boats just because we were girls. I said, well, that's a bit too much for me. Now I already have to learn how to make you know, no crepes that, and how to make eggs. I want to go on the boat. And so after lots of struggles, we had to finally manage to, to convince our headmaster to, to build the girls' first rowing team. And we trained so hard that after the first season, we won South African champions for girls. Um, it wasn't that difficult because there weren't many of us you know, on the competition. But it really proved that we can do anything we want, you know. So from being a victim, we became survivors, we became activists, and really became the force for good. And really showed that throughout my life, when women get together, when we have the same purpose, we put our energy together, we can change anything we want. So later on in life, when I became an entrepreneur, I built my company, my first company in, in the digital space. I found out, you know, realized that there weren't a lot of men, women in, in tech. Um, but I thought that things were getting better. I really thought, you know, it was 20, 2017 then when I really, you know, was experiencing that. And then I said to myself, well, let me go to, to Web Summit. Let's try and get inspired by other women um, and see how, you know, we can correlate. Because I had just had my fourth pregnancy. I was exhausted mentally, you know, physically. I had laid down for six months. <laughs> and when I went there, I saw this amazing woman. And I said, and they told me, we're still not enough. But the thing is, the gap was getting bigger, right? For the past four decades, the gender gap in technology was getting wider and not smaller. And that blew my mind away. I said, that is not possible. What are we doing about it? So we were just there, like, you know, getting tickets. They were, had like a little percentage of a discount, but that's not going to solve the problem, right? Solve the problem and take actions on the ground to make things happen. So I looked around the things that were going on, and then there were many initiatives, but were isolated, but they were doing good things. Otherwise, there would be like networking. They would just network, which is great. It's super important, but just networking won't change either. So I said to myself, let's put something all together. We have to be a community because the force, the power of community, it's, it's outrageous, it's important, and that's throughout that's the amazing. world. Yeah, And then we have to have programs because if you don't implement programs from the yeah. grassroots levels in the education system, in entrepreneurs, in all the systems, it will not work. And yeah. obviously we have to do it globally mm -hmm. because there's not one single country in the world that has achieved gender parity. 
So this thank you so much. <laughs> we will get back to our uh, you know on this topic of women in tech definitely. Um, thank you so much from your about your journey from victim to being victorious. So I'll get back to that. But I would now like to request Deborah Wong to kindly share about her journey, please. I'm Deborah Wang. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have many years experience in founding companies, and I start successful high tech company and raising money for raising money for my company. Also, make a sizable return for my shareholder. In my journey of running company, I see uh, the major issue is uh, women are so underrepresented in the STEM uh, sector. So I think uh, you know. Uh, the initiative need to, need to be provided to be able to uh, make provide women better opportunity to be better represented in this sector. And as we all know, uh, United Nations have been working on promoting gender equality for a long period of time. Also, uh, United Nations they advocates that gender equity is the foundation to gender equality. To, to, oh, no. to equity. Yeah, so my internet connection not good, you know, it's cut off a lot. So, okay, so, so gender equity is the process of being fair to women to ensure strategy to compensate for women's women historical and social disadvantage and discriminations. So in, so in order to compensate for women's historical and social disadvantages and discrimination, the mandate need to be implemented. So the, yeah. I think that's very important. So to give yeah. level of women level playing ground with men. So what I want to talk about today is how to compensate for women historical and social disadvantage and discrimination as the family caregiver in our society. That's Amazing. Thank you so much for enlightening us about your journey, Deborah. And there's so much that we can learn from you uh, during this panel discussion. Um, uh, the fourth uh, World Conference on Women set out this vision and commitments for achieving uh, gender equality in the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. So 2020 was intended to be a groundbreaking, uh, you know, for accelerated realization of gender equality. But the uh, uh, and the empowerment of women and girls, um, but it seems COVID nineteen has reversed the limited progress that um, uh, that were made in gender equality and women's rights. So collective action need to be taken at both policy level and implementation level to address the issue of gender equality. So I would like to begin with Amelia. What, in your opinion, do you think needs to change? And uh, as a United Nations expert on gender economic governance, please enlighten us on the UN Sustainable Development Agenda on SDG 5 uh, for gender equality and the frameworks um, mandated by the UN to follow the implementation of the women empowerment principles. Thank you. Well, I have two colleagues here. I think that then when Constance is going to tell more about this, uh, what she calls about mainstreaming and that women are not just the beneficiaries of what's happening in the world and the problems so they receive the impact of what's not working and the benefits of the programs to resolve the issues that uh, they are experiencing that mainstreaming that needs to come from the top of the world the decision making levels in order to mainstream this uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion on all the rights uh, to be mainstream. That's fundamental. And then she will go into this very specific into programming. But uh, what is happening at the global level, the Beijing Platform of Action, that is a fundamental mechanism, instrument, because I see also in your questions about uh, should we uh, kind of, what is mandatory? <laughs> should, there be, uh, should there be any sanctions for countries that are not really embedding this, uh, these policies and programs? Okay. So the UN agenda is not mandatory. It's not, it's, it's not a mandatory agenda. And the Beijing platform of action in that sense recognizes there is this uh, famous, uh, from Hillary Clinton, the global recognition on the planet that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights as well. So the level that women should be recognized as a human being and have the entitlement of all human rights that are disposable just for being a human being. 
So not just for the fact of being a woman, you should be lacking any kind of capacity as a human. So all of these rights would be embodied. And indeed, you are mentioning, so that was a Beijing platform of action, where not just the small associations, it was the kind of saying to set up the commission on the status of women. What is the status of women in politics, in health, in all the dimensions? And then this is what happens every 8th of March at the United Nations, where you have two weeks where the United Nations through UN Women opens the Commission on the Status of Women and the rollout of the implementation of the Beijing Platform of Action. The Beijing Platform of Action is, was the most important mechanism to roll out the implementation of laws, policies and programs at the country level. But as you know, so this implementation, not all stakeholders, so uh, I'm going to go to the, what is the SDG 5? The SDG 5 is after the Millennium Development Goals, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, where more problems, it's not about, it's like the Paris Agreement. So uh, the problem of climate change is not happening in developing countries. Sustainable development is a responsibility for all the planets, all the, all the countries in this plan. The SDG 5 recognizes that gender equality is a pillar in itself, is a goal in itself, but is intrinsic and fundamental for the, achievement, for the achievement of all the sustainable development goals. So before the SDG that was in 2015, we had that, for example, uh, uh, gender equality issues would be maternal health only. But in that sense, when you have the sustainable development agenda as a recognition that without equity and equality, you will not have any kind of development in any country. So that was... But we are talking only about in 2015. So there has been an acceleration of progress uh, to accelerate this agenda of gender equality and climate change and other issues in order to integrate this Beijing platform of action and put the important stakeholders in place in order to implement. So who are the important? What is gender economic governance? This year is that finally heads of state ministers of economy and especially multinationals and corporations are coming under the SDG 17 the public and private partnerships in order to accelerate economic and social opportunities, especially finance, uh, finance for development and partnerships in order to come together, not only women as a matter of let's network and let's do, because that's fundamental to put the society and the, um, uh, the civil society to advocate and to, to leverage the, the state of the communities all around the world. But then you need to find the, the stakeholder who's inclusive. Eh? And this is the private sector and these are the governments everywhere as well in order to attract and retain this talent. So the enlightened point here that most of companies are understanding and especially ministries of economy to fund this gender equality agenda to accelerate these positions all around the country and decision-making um, uh, decision positions, especially in corporate boards, is that uh, diversity is fundamental for innovation and corporate performance and competitive advantage. So in the 21st century, gender equality is an, is an a strategic issue. So in that sense, you really need to put all of this talent uh, to attract, to make, um, uh, to make the case uh, for business, uh, for uh, that gender equality means business, in order to mainstream all these equity instruments in your company. But I will pass the floor into more detail, but yeah. that is the most fundamental thing, that sustainable de development happens everywhere, and uh, not only me, but companies and governments need to take action to put all of this talent on the right place. Thank you so much. And I really like your statement that human rights are women's right. And, and the human and these goals are fundamental to success of everything. So um, and um, the, the, but the fact is that women are engaged in taking care of children, elderly, performing chores. And um, and these jobs, they play a very integral role in development and you know, nurturing the society. But they usually comprise of unpaid work. So now when women carry out at least um, actually two and a half times more unpaid household and care work than men, as a result, they have very limited uh, time for, you know, lesser time for education, paid labor or long working hours in the offices. And this kind of severely limits their chances to develop their capabilities and exercise, exercise uh, freedom of choice um, in regards to. Uh, even matters in life, what they like the most and what they want to pursue the most. So now uh, my question now is to Deborah. What do you think Asian countries need to do 
to recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care, and domestic work for women to achieve um, UN goals for gender equality. Um, so yeah. So today uh, I want to talk about recognizing care and domestic work for women to uh, for inclusive growth and sustainable development to achieve UN goal for gender equality. As we all know, one of the major significant constraints for women's economic empowerment is the um, disproportionate, disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work that women undertake. Women undertake four times the amount of unpaid care and domestic work as men, and this hinders women's freedom to choose to work outside the home. We need to shift our attitude about women's role in society. In many countries, societal attitude hold women back. Attitude regarding women's role as family caregivers are the key reason that women undertake a disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work, and to force to stay out of workforce and to face conscious and conscious discrimination in the workplace. Redistributing this disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work. Will unleash women's economic potential and to enhance development outcomes. The development outcomes provided by United Nations are the following: Number one, reduce unpaid work for women will increase time for women to increase engage in decent work and economic opportunities. Number two, reduce unpaid work for women will allow women to be able to participate in education. Number three, reduce unpaid work for women will allow women to participate in leadership, leadership and politics. And finally, reduce work of unpaid work for women will allow women to have time to self do self care, to care for themselves and the leisure activities. So, in order to free women up to work, engage to work for pay outside the home, the following initiative need to be implemented. Number one. Expanding affordable childcare, as we all know, women have been historically disadvantaged with the burden of childcare. So it is very important for the implementation to expand affordable childcare, such as government subsidized childcare, company daycare, to help women balance their childcare obligation. Number two, improving household and transport info, info, infrastructure. The improvement on household and transport infrastructure will reduce reducing the commuting time for women between work and home and older activity. Number three, implementation of digital technologies. Digital technologies such as digital banking, digital payment, have saved enormous time for women for spending time traveling to a physical bank or ATM and staying in line. Furthermore, the telecommuting adopted by business nowadays. Also, allow women to stay in workforce to work from home if they so choose. And number four, share and pay care and domestic work more equally between men and women. So, for instance, policy promoting parental leave and flexible working. Flexible working is a very useful mechanism to allow women to be able to come in later, work later, or work from home to help women to balance their. House, house, housekeeping, elder care, and the child care obligation. Why should we all care about this? Four point five trillion dollars could be added to GDP for Asia Pacific by two thousand twenty five. So, ASEAN, OCD globally need to work together to achieve UN goal for gender equality. This will make our world a richer and better place for everyone. Thank you so much, Deborah, for you know point wise describing what needs to change at a societal level, at implementation level, uh, and very uh, it was very interesting that you pointed out about the professional world. And it's a known fact that the professional world does not offer a level playing ground for women, especially in light of current uh, you know COVID circumstances when the boundaries between work and home have really been blurred. Um, serious actions really need to be taken uh, to address the needs of working women, especially in the COVID and the post-COVID era. Now, having underrepresentation of women at senior position kind of seriously limits, you know, uh, their concerns from being addressed and their voices from being heard.
So my next question is to you, Hedwish. Um, uh, Europe holds the top three spots for gender equality in the World Economic Forum 2021 uh, reports, with Iceland, Finland, and Norway taking the lead, and Ireland and Switzerland joining the high scores in the list of t- uh, top ten. So what lessons can Asia learn to address female gender gap issues? You are a highly accomplished professional and a businesswoman. How do you think are the European women on boards promoting gender equality in the C-suite and the board? And what do you think it matters? You know, why do you think really uh, it matters to have women in the position of power and influence? Yes, it's a very good question. So to start with your first one, so how can we explain the success of Europe? I think that there are a number of elements that play here. Uh, Amalia has uh, talked about it, Deborah as well. Of course, you have a very good education system, so equal access to education is very important. But then when moving to the labor uh, environment, having that child care, to have a, a dual career, both at home and in the workplace, is very, very important. And even more important, it's also about the expectation of society. So um, in lots of European countries, it's just a normal thing to work, to work with both parents and to try to have an arrangement, even though, as Amalia said, there can be differences with, uh, within Europe. I would say that um, that system of education, healthcare, Um, uh, childcare and expectations from society are very strong elements that can push forward uh, women into the labor force and actually be a win for society as a whole. What we do as European women on boards is going even further and really make sure that women not only work, but also are present at the decision table. And that is what I'm working on right now. All the important issues in the world, be it COVID, be it climate, have much more impact on women than men. And yet, they are not at the decision table. And we also know that women have very often a better solution. So no woman at the table means that you will not get the female view, the female priority, and it's a lose-lose. And with European women on boards, we work on all the key levies. The women, of course, With training programs, we want 1,000 women ready for the C-suite and the board, a talent pool. With training programs, everything you need to know and you don't learn at university. But we also work with the Commission, political level. And I think every lady in this room is doing this, working on policy, top-down, working on the directive, working on a quota, working with all the agencies that follow up on gender diversity. The third thing is working with the countries. We are European organizations, but we work with each EU country. And increasingly, I'm also asked to work together with women on board Japan, women on board Kenya, uh, engineer women in US. So work together as a network is very powerful. And last but not least, engage with men, engage with companies, engage with headhunters. Rather than see them as bystanders, make them allies. So I just set up a task force to engage with each single of the 600 largest companies in Europe. Not to come and criticize them, but to come and listen where they are in terms of gender diversity, where they are in terms of diversity in general, learn from them. I've been doing lobbying for 30 years. Don't try to be right, listen. Listen to them, engage in a conversation, and then at some point they will ask, what do you think? And that's the right moment to step in and say, okay, what about this program? What about mentoring? What about sponsoring? Even more important, what about checking the numbers and really make sure that you have women at each step and that you try to find out why are they leaving? Same with headhunters. Have a code of conduct. How many women do you have in your talent pool? How many do you invite? What is the long list? What is the short list? What is your perception? And then how can we learn from that? So it's a whole journey, but it's fascinating. So I would say it's not that Europe is better. I think we have perhaps learned a couple of things, but Asia is moving fast. And in my job in the banking industry, my next chair will be a Japanese woman. 
that's amazing yeah i mean uh, uh, really a lot of points to learn from europe and uh, asia really needs to learn at the family societal level and you know the corporate level um actually now one of the uh, the biggest challenges that i now see is that the whole world is going tech and women continue to be under underrepresented in the fields of science technology engineering they represent only slightly more than 35% of the world's stem graduates and less than 30% of the world's researchers are women and this underrepresentation occurs in every region of the world so now my next question is to you ayumi um as a successful technopreneur what do you think is the reason behind this and what needs to be done at this uh, you know at the systemic level at the policy level to address this issue Uh, you are on mute uh, con uh, ayumi <laughs> i am sorry uh, i'm back <laughs> so i was saying that i uh, thank you so much for this question that really very close to my heart i'm very passionate about it because it's so important for us today and unfortunately if it was a uh, if i had just one single answer for this it would be so much more simple to be able to tackle it and find a solution but there are a multitude of reasons for this i can think that you know it goes from challenges such as um cultural norms biases to lack of self confidence for women access to education access to opportunity and when you go to the entrepreneurial level obviously access to funding so there is really a very large prism of challenges but also opportunities that we have to try and grasp and make better for us to be able to to be better representation but i would start first from the beginning so that we really be um education right so i think that to be able to if you look at what's happening today today there are about 74% of girls when they arrive in about early years of teenage 12 13 that have interest to go into stem education but there are only 28% at the end of the day that have no stem degrees so there's a huge gap um from when they want to choose what career path to where they're getting what they really study but this i would say to the western world right because in other countries depending on the region we don't have we have we have around the world a lack of women in the workforce and then we have a leaky pipeline all along the way and in some countries the leaky pipeline will come from education some will come afterwards for wanting to go into the workforce so for instance i was in the uae this whole week and they don't have the problem in much more in, in education they have a lot of women engineers attention lots of women engineers when it comes to coding like maybe one fifth but they do have women in the scientific but they don't go to the workforce in the western countries i would say much like say europe or or south or north america to make it very general um the the problem comes as early as education and for this we have to support them you know making it something more more interesting for girls giving them access to um to digital literacy classes as as young as from the when they're 5 years old because the bias you know the way you shape your mind and the roles um it comes from that early age and for this we have to also to add skill building like strategic thinking because if you think that in 2030 they say like wild numbers let's see if it's going to be true or not that 85% of the jobs they don't exist yet even if they of these young girls that are going to school right now and they're learning all these skills by the end of the day when they get out it's going to be very old right because they have going to be new skills that are going to be needed so i think we have to reform the whole educational system but you know how long it takes and how how expensive and especially it's very conformative conservative um thing so i think there has to be a real partnership between um governments and the educational ministries as well as um corporates and you know a new educational companies that were able to kind of blend in and form a specific program uh, but for everyone right i think it has to be a partnership because it can't just be for the private schools and for the people that have money it has to be on the public education because everything everyone has to have equal access to this because the digital divide that was has grown with the pandemic is enormous and we don't want to leave anyone behind so it's not about gender it's also about social inclusion and this comes from education and if you put the partners with corporate and with the with the with the government that's how we can make change <laughs> absolutely 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's from the education plan. Obviously, afterwards, I think we have to learn how to continue skilling all throughout our life because, as I said, we have to be able to reskill, um, learn new things all along the way. Um, so that comes from mindset, right? Um, learning how to be agile, strategic thinking, design thinking. And this is something and being able to be resilient and reinventing yourself every time along the way. Um, so these are things, these soft skills, um, also are the soft skills that they're going to be the most needed um, in the future of work. Because these are the skills that the robots are going to be very challenging for them to learn, right? <laughs> Until they learn that, you know, we have like a, a step ahead. So these are the things they're going to be looking for. So we have low code today, which is going to be coding more easy. Now let, yeah. let the robots do that. They're good in coding, okay? <laughs> we can, we have to understand how it's done, but we have to take the step forward. We have to bring in empathy, creativity, you know, um, make right. sure yeah. that things, so this is what we have to bring to the table. And absolutely, that's absolutely. So thank you so much, you know, Ayumi. I mean, you have really very important points to make. But I have this, you know, I have another amazing speaker, Constance, who's actually going to shed light on the point that you're making and she'll add to that. So Constance, you have been working in the voluntary sector, developing national and international prog programs with engaged communities and organizations to create the conditions for equality and change. So in your opinion, what should be done at a systemic level to transform the women's lives and enable them to, you know, reverse these vulnerabilities? Um, so in your opinion, what do these Asian countries need to do to accomplish UN goals? Thank you. I Thank think you. Um, yeah. with our Nesta challenges, we work across a, a variety of different themes. So we're topic agnostic. We'll work in agriculture. We'll work in fintech, in energy, um, in aging populations. So we have to take a really holistic approach to, to what we're doing and ensure that we're really engaging the broadest range of stakeholder groups within that, whether that be policymakers, industry, um, you know, academia, um, innovators and practitioners on the ground. And I think that's the approach that we need to take when it comes to gender equality and parity. You know, we cannot put women in a box, um, you know, in terms of a group to, for things to be done to or for, you know, uh, we have to engage in a much more holistic way and a more intentional way. Um, and I think from from our experience, you know, we have run challenge prizes which haven't been successful in engaging women. And we've had to look at that and re review why um, and that, you know, that may have been that we didn't have enough. Uh, women in uh, innovators come forward with ideas for a particular challenge. And so when you review those things, you have to consider language, approach. Are you using the right case studies? Are you using the right imagery that enables women to understand that they can be part of that process and, and, and it's, it's for them? You know, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, you know, a systemic approach is not just about putting in place a singular action. It's about considering language considering how the design of a program is done and how women are involved in that um, process, considering um, when you're looking at need, not lumping women as a homogenous group, but doing some of that nuanced thinking about, well, yes, there may be a, a group of women that you're trying to approach that are um, based in the informal sector. So what are the situations that are really, um, you know, they're challenged with? Um, and how do you start to think more intentionally about how you engage them in a process or what the outcomes of your program should be um, to really better that situation for, for participation. So a systemic approach for me is really about this um, thread that runs throughout everything we're doing from the thought process and the thinking and the scoping and coming up with the programs to how we actually start to take action in communicating um, in implementing and engaging throughout the process. So whether that be um, women involved predominantly in um, designing the program, in uh, implementing the program, in thinking about design. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to make sure that we are thinking very intentionally about the, those aspects of, of things. You know, we, we kind of talk about having gender lenses on things and, and we can get quite rhetorical about this. We can, we can start to kind of theorize a little bit, um, but we have to kind of look at real tangible experiences and make that um, from the policy level down, something that's very tangible um, uh, for women. We have to give the appropriate space. We have to give the, you know, 
my esteemed panel of colleagues have talked about some of the key considerations that we, you know, women will experience. One of the things that we've also had to do with our challenges when we're building criteria or thinking about programs that do have a specific gender lens, for instance, we also have to consider the language that we're using in terms of women as a challenge. Women are not a challenge. The, the issues that they uh, experience, the situations yeah. that they face are the challenge. And sorry I think to, those are the sorts of things. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Constance. We have uh, we have approached the end of the, the whole. It's this, you are all so awesome. They have so many points to share. And, um, and, and I wish this was longer. But yes, uh, I think you've ended it very well, Constance. You know, for everything that we do at each step, from the family, from the societal level to employment, to policy development, to education, to implementation, every step we need to wear the gender lens and ensure and uh, remember that, you know, the, the, all the changes will happen, all the fundamental goals that we are looking to achieve for peace, stability, development, growth, with the gender issue is the, the heart of it all. If this is not resolved, other things are going to be affected as well. So thank you, ladies. Um, really, thanks a lot for such amazing. And I'm very sorry, you know, um, for interrupting you all in between. You know, as a timekeeper, I think I hate that job to do. But you've all made some very, very amazing comments. And I'm sure all the participants have benefited you know, tremendously from your inputs. Um, we don't have time to, you know, for for the for other participants to ask questions. But I really thought thank General Sharma, uh, Kal Sam, and Dr. Rajiv for being that amazing audience and you know constantly showing that thumbs up and you know boosting our morale. Um, uh, uh, yes, thanks a lot. Um, can we take a picture? Um, Yes. And thanks a lot for an amazing panel. Thank um, you. Thank you, ladies. Thank um, you. Let's catch up afterwards offline, ladies. At some point, you know, we all have each other's emails. I would love to carry on the conversation. And, you know, when you come to France or if I come to your place, over a glass of wine. Thank let you. Me come to Singapore. Sounds great. I'll, I'll be your host in Singapore. Please let me know. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and, and I'm going to travel a lot. So, <laughs> yes, I'm coming, I think, on the 9th or the 7th. I'll, I'm going to email you so we can organize that. Perfect. Amazing. And Constance, I mean, it was amazing. You should contact with the ILO, the Gender Academy, please. Oh, I'd love to. The Gender Academy of the ILO. I'm going to, oh. I'm going to recommend you. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much.